Welcome everyone. I'm Camilia Rodriguez Sackburn with the Global Brain Health Institute. We're really happy to have you all here and to see people joining. Today's program is presented by our partners at the Global Teleneurology Service, and it focuses on track two of this series, exploring core challenges in global neurology. Our topic is collaborative care model for integrating mental health into primary, primary care systems in low resource settings. At this time when so many are facing the impact of COVID-19 across the world, well-being and mental health for all are topics we value the opportunity to discuss, particularly in thinking about communities that would be disproportionately impacted and hopeful ways that mental health services before, during, and after this crisis are being made available. A few housekeeping items. Please share any questions or ideas in the chat box, which Andrew will be monitoring. Thanks so much, Andrew. Please mute yourselves to avoid any background noise. The 90-minute program will be recorded. Um, let me just try to advance this slide. There we go. Um, just a kind note, these presentations are provided for educational purposes only. The program is not designed to provide advice on care of patients, which remains solely the responsibility of physicians in country. Our speaker today is Dr. Bibhav Acharya. I'm very pleased to invite John Van Leeuwen with the Global Teleneurology Service to introduce Dr. Acharya. Thanks, Camelia, and good morning, all. Thank you all for joining. Uh, we're excited to have Biva Bacharya here with us today. We've been interested in having him speak uh, in this forum for a little bit, and it's fitting maybe that it's, it's come at this time with all that's going on. Uh, and he has a wealth of experience to share what he's been doing globally. Uh, he's the co-founder and mental health advisor of Possible, a nonprofit organization that has been providing health services in rural Nepal since 2008. Uh, you'll hear more about that today. Additionally, he is the founding director of UCSF Psychiatry HEAL Fellowship, which is a global health uh, in, focused on global mental health, which provides psychiatrists as leaders equipped with diverse skill sets ranging from clinical practice to capacity building and low resource settings. That's both domestically here in the U.S. Uh, throughout Navajo Nation, also abroad in rural Nepal. Lastly, I'll note that the pioneering work that Bivab is leading also hits close to home for him as he was born and raised in Nepal. Uh, so we're delighted that he's part of our psychiatry program here at uh, UCSF, an assistant professor there, and delighted to welcome him to the program and hear from his, his remarks today. So Bivap, take it away. Thanks, John. Uh, and yeah, thanks everyone for joining. This is uh, these are trying times to say the least, and I appreciate everyone sort of coming together uh, to, to talk about this. Uh, and then, you know, thanks GVHI and, and Global Teleneurology to put the, for putting this together. Um, so today, um, I'm mainly going to be talking about uh, the mental health work that we've done over the last several years in rural Nepal. Um, but COVID is on everyone's mind, um, so you know, at, at the very end, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to introduce some of the work that we're doing. Very preliminary, it's just a lot of stuff is evolving, so I'm happy to talk about that as well if people have interest. But the main focus is going to be on building sort of uh, mental health care delivery systems as part of primary care in low resource settings. So the funding for the work that I uh, will be talking about today is provided by a bunch of different entities, as you can see. Uh, on, your, on your left, uh, Possible, which is a nonprofit that I co-founded, and the government of Nepal, these two entities fund sort of the, the healthcare delivery engine. So they're just, just taking care of patients, the staff and space and everything. Uh, and the sites that I'll be talking about are actually owned by the Nepali government, but operated by the nonprofit in a multi-year MOU with the government. On the right side are the sources of funding for the research work that I'll be talking about today. So we have a couple of NIH grants, a seed grant from uh, Harvard, and then my department, and then some additional grants from uh, a local philanthropist who I'm joining here. There are several people uh, involved in the work that I'll be talking about from UCSF, uh, my, my primary mentor and collaborator, Maria Ekstrand and uh, Craig Van Dyke. Duncan is my co-PI in most of these grants uh, at, at Arnold Institute in Sinai and several other folks uh, from multiple institutions and possible again, the nonprofit that, uh, that, that's running these services. Several people there, pretty much everyone at possible is, is essential for making this happen. 
Um, so, so quickly run through the learning objectives here. So hoping that people can at least go away with two pieces of key data that describe how, how bad the situation is when you think about mental, neurological, and substance use disorders. And I'll be using this designation, MNS. Um, some people may be familiar with it. This is how the WHO sort of thinks about these three interrelated um, issues in, in, in the global burden of disease. And then the second part is going to be talking about sort of what are the strengths and limitations of collaborative care model. It's a specific type of uh, care delivery system uh, in global mental health. And then finally, we'll talk about what kind of modifications do we need to make uh, to sort of the, these existing best practices so that we can meet the MNS needs in low resource settings. And as was mentioned at the beginning, uh, as questions come up, please put them in the chat box. And I'll try to pause every now and then to see if, you know, if we're sort of moving forward to the next section to see if people have any burning questions. And, and there, there's gonna be time at the end to, to talk more as well. Uh, and the way we'll be organizing our discussion today, we'll talk about the MNS burden at the beginning and then just introduce Nepal and the, the nonprofit possible. We'll talk about task sharing. I'm sure most people have heard of this. Uh, and then some of these sort of evidence-based practices around task sharing. But we'll also really take a deep dive into some of the challenges and potential opportunities when we think about task sharing in these contexts and, and at the end we'll have a discussion about this. So the, the first thing to think about is the, is the burden of disease, right? So again, some of this may be familiar to people, but when you combine mental, neurological, and substance use disorders, and you look at disability adjusted life years, DALIs, among all the chronic diseases in the world, MNS disorders are actually the number one contributor. So that's the first thing I'd like people to take away. That these are not sort of fringe issues. These are not sort of rare diseases. When you combine MNS together, they're the number one contributor to chronic diseases when you measure the burden of uh, disease uh, in terms of disability adjusted life. So a quick primer on DALIs. DALIs combine both mortality and disability. Uh, so when you combine both of them and not just look at what's the number one killer, or not just look at the, the, the reason for disability, combine both of them, which is a more sort of a holistic and accurate um, uh, metric for measuring the burden of disease, uh, that's where the MNS disorders really show that, that they're not being addressed, that there's a huge population burden. Now let's, let's look at the specialists available, or the workforce available to take care of MNS diseases. And this is you know, generally psychiatrists and, and neurologists. In low-income countries, the ratio of a psychiatrist to the population is about one into two million. And the ratio of a neurologist to the population is about one into three million. I do not want to be that psychiatrist who has the responsibility of taking care of two million people. And I'm sure no one here who's a neurologist wants to be the psychiatrist who has three million people on the campus. And again, to make things even worse, uh, these are national numbers in low income countries. So as you go further away from you know, urban centers and towards rural regions, this, this ratio becomes, this just becomes ridiculous. It becomes meaningless after a certain point. One is, one is five million or something absurd, which really has no meaning. At that point, you could have zero and you would have the exact same impact. So, so these are the two things as we think about how do we address, you know, the mental health, neurological health, and substance use problems. You have huge population burden. We have incredible, incredibly scar scarce uh, healthcare, sort of specialized healthcare resources. So this is where we, we go forward. This is sort of the, the foundation of the problem that we're trying to solve. So let me talk a little bit more about uh, the context where I've been doing my work. So this is a picture that I took. People think I took this from a plane or a helicopter. I did not. Nepal is a very mountainous country. I took this picture from another mountain, <laughs> a bunch of other mountains. Uh, and this is, this is the road that connects um, the site where I do my work, uh, the nonprofit we started back in 2007. And it's a very remote part of Nepal. Nepal is a tiny country, 30 million people, sort of sandwiched between Tibet and, and India. But for someone who lives in a town where we work, it takes about 30 hours by bus to get to the capital, going down this winding road. And the nearest psychiatrist is uh, 14 hours away, and so is the nearest neurologist. And when we started working here, it was a, it was a region of about 250,000 people. And there wasn't a single physician, not a specialist, just any physician, there was a single physician there. And to get any basic service, just your kid has diarrhea, what do you do? Uh, you had to get on the bus for about three hours from the nearest bus station. If you lived further away from the bus station, you gotta walk to the bus station uh, and then you get on the bus. So 
again, at this point, it doesn't even matter whether healthcare services are available or not. It's effectively you don't have anything. Uh, and, and not surprisingly, this is also the region that has the highest rates of immigration because the local economy is not very strong. So a lot of people go to India seasonally and go back and forth for work, which, you know, as you can think about to COVID, it's, it's, it's become a hotbed because of this region, because of this reason. And then, and then uh, combine that with uh, the rates of HIV. It has the highest rates of HIV in all of Nepal largely initially fueled by migrant workers who got HIV from sex workers uh, when they were in India, come back, give it to their wives and have kids, and a lot of them actually ended up dying. There's, there's a lot of orphans. Let me, let me try to mute. Oh, there you go. Thank you. <clears throat> um, so, so, yeah, so, so a lot of, lot of overlapping burdens, uh, as, again, not surprising because these things sort of feed off of each other. When you think about just basic... Human Development Index, it is, uh, it's at the bottom three among, among the 75 districts in the country. So high rates of poverty, uh, horrible infrastructure for healthcare, high rates of HIV, gender-based violence, and, and just economically very marginalized, and then geographically very marginalized. Uh, and this is a picture, again, from 2008, I think, um, of the road. So, you know, mudslides are very common, landslides are very common, it's a mountainous region, you bring the monsoon. This is the road that, that I mentioned. It's the only road connecting this region to the rest of the world. And, uh, and there's landslides every now and then. So imagine being able to get supplies in, being able to, you know, being able to get people out and, and, and ambulances and everything just easily blocked uh, for several days at a time. Uh, this, was, uh, this was a hospital that was built by the Nepali government about 35 years ago. And when we approached uh, this region, this hospital had really been in disarray. They had built, the Nepal government had built it about 35 years ago. And because of political reasons, they moved the hospital closer to the house of people who had better political clout. And that was about six to seven hours away. So they essentially built infrastructure. And at some point, someone more powerful sort of said, ah, I'd like to have this hospital near where I live. And then they were able to convince the, the king, back then Nepal was a monarchy, to move this hospital. So before they even saw any patients, the army was sent in to physically carry all the equipment and move it to another location. As you can imagine, the locals were not happy about it. So they said, you can't, you can't just take the hospital away. Uh, and they, they, they were sort of saying, you know, we're not gonna let you do it. And the king authorized use of deadly force and they shot and killed six protesters. Uh, and, and, and again, forced this hospital to be moved. Um, so I had this very bitter history of, you know, just being ignored by the government and, you know, just a lot of you know, failure of trust in the authorities. And when we went in, this was completely abandoned. As you can see, you know, in, in disarray, there's a, there's a water buffalo hanging out here because there's no people, there's no services. Uh, and this is sort of when, uh, when we sort of set our eyes on this hospital saying, you know, this could be a potential space uh, to really operate and rejuvenate and provide services in the region. This was a picture from one of the rooms. Like I said, it's essentially non-functional, vandalized. Everything that could be taken away had been taken away. Uh, <clears throat> this is an older picture. So this is after renovation. So this is when uh, the Nepali government and our nonprofit signed a five-year agreement to operate this hospital system. Solar panels, as you can see, super important. And the main grid is not reliable. Uh, and most of the work that I'll be talking about today is going to be based uh, at this hospital. Uh, this is a, the inside of the diagnostic lab. This is the pharmacy. So, so it's sort of a primary healthcare system that's all embedded within the same system. So we can't say, go, go get this medication from somewhere else because, you know, the poverty rates are so high. The average person makes about 50 cents a day. Um, lab, surgical services, uh, an electronic health record, which was the first uh, in Nepal using uh, open MRS. But it's an open access program if people are interested. I'm happy to talk more about that. So this is the inpatient unit, and this is one of our nurses using the EHR. Uh, if you work in the U.S., uh, thinking about EHR gives you a little bit of a panic attack. I realize uh, this is a, this is a lot simpler, straightforward EHR that's not designed for billing because this is a government system. There's no user fees. Uh, it's really designed to help with decision support and, and collect key data. This so it's, it's it's very simple to use. It's a lot simpler than. The, the, the EHR that I use, it's a lot low burden than the EHR that I use at UCSF. Um, and, and a community health worker. So this is a community health worker who uses a mobile phone. Again, if people are interested in the, the data infrastructure side of this, 
We use ComCare, which is very widely used around the world. Uh, and she uses uh, the, the ComCare decision support tool to counsel uh, patients at their homes and their communities. Uh, and, and possible employees are 200 plus community health workers uh, in their region. Uh, this is a more recent picture of the same hospital, more solar panels, more construction. And then after the 2015 earthquake uh, in Nepal, uh, there was another region. Oh, so this, this first hospital, fortunately, was far enough from the epicenter that we, we were spared. We, we didn't really get affected by it directly. Uh, but there was another region in Nepal called Golaka, which was at the epicenter of this major earthquake. And 85% of the healthcare infrastructure was destroyed by the earthquake. So the Nepali government said, approached us and said, would you be interested in replicating this model at this second site? Our first response was, we're not disaster you know, relief organization. We don't do humanitarian crisis management. We do long-term health delivery. Uh, and you know, the Nepali government sort of said, that's what we need. You know, we're, we're past this you know, thinking in terms of crisis management, crisis management. We really want to build durable healthcare systems. And we said, yeah, we know how to do that. So we, we took over this building again, you know, finish it up, um, and then between these two sites, uh, there's about, at this point, about 360 staff members. Each hospital is about a 60-bed uh, hospital, primary care, uh, sort of a district-level hospital, if people are familiar with that term, uh, and, uh, and, and provides all sort of general services. And this is where we're doing our mental health work, layering onto this primary care system. So before I move into forward, Someone, I don't know if they were talking to someone else or had a question, but uh, before I move on, any questions? Take that as a no. And then put your questions in the chat box, I think is the, is the direction. All right, so let's talk about mental health in particular. So let me start by talking about this patient. When I first saw him, he was, uh, he was 16. He was, was a young boy, a high school student uh, in, in the local region. And he came from a, a low caste, so Nepal's caste system is, is pretty pervasive, especially in the rural regions where we work. He came from a low caste, but, uh, but was brilliant. He was actually at the top of his class in, in, in the school. And a brilliant kid, and as you can imagine, the family had so much hope and promise, is you know, living in abject poverty uh, and having a son who's brilliant and he's doing so well. And unfortunately, about a few months before, three or four months before I saw him, uh, he started to sort of go downhill. So, you know, your grades were slipping, wasn't really paying attention in class, was being a little bit disruptive. Uh, and then the teachers are saying, what's wrong with this kid? Like, is he on drugs? Like, we got to do something about him. And the family didn't know what to do with him. And then eventually he started to sort of, you know, uh, mumble to himself and, you know, act erratically. So, you know, you know where this is going. So eventually he sort of started slipping into a psychosis. And got to a point where he couldn't go to school anymore. The teacher said, you're not allowed to come back in because you're too disruptive. So the family was trying to keep him at home while also, you know, working in the farms and, you know, they have busy lives. And eventually his behavior got so bad that uh, he started sort of destroying neighbors' property and, you know, causing all these damages. And, and, and the neighbors would come to the family and say, now you got to pay for that thing that he destroyed. So the family was taking out loans to essentially pay for the things that he was destroying in the neighborhood. And they didn't know what else to do. So they took him to a traditional healer, he didn't get better, and his behavior kept getting worse and worse. So the family resorted to tying him up. So he, his, in this picture, his only, only his uh, arms are tied up. But uh, the family told me that for about two weeks um, before coming to the clinic, uh, he was tied up in a fetal position, both, both legs and arms, uh, for two weeks straight, 24 hours. That's how he was sleeping. That's how he was eating. That's how he was toileting. So the family did not know how to control his behavior. And he was disruptive and, you know, danger to self and others for sure. And then they, they, they took him to a series of traditional healers and you know, continued to not get better. And then finally, they were going to apparently walk three hours to go to another traditional healer. And someone from the neighborhood sort of said, hey, there's this new hospital. It might be worth taking him there. Uh, so they decided to walk uh, about four hours it takes for them to come to our clinic. And, and that's when they released his, his feet so he could walk, but they had still tied up his wrists. Uh, so, so he showed up and, you know, I, I got to see him and he was, he was, he could not understand anything he was, he was saying. He was completely disorganized, uh, delusional, uh, and again, behavior really very difficult. So, so how do we get to a situation like this, right? So, so in Nepal, uh, how, does, how does someone who's, who carries so much promise 
spend months and months just being tied up, being harassed, being beaten, and, and causing so much you know, stress for the family uh, with really receiving no, no, no appropriate or effective, I should say, uh, mental health services. So look at some of the, let's look at some of the systematic factors uh, that, that contribute to a situation like this. So when you look at the, the percentage of money allocated to mental health services uh, among the sort of total pool of healthcare delivery, it's only 0.7%. And this is on par with how most low-income countries sort of allocate resources for mental health. It's about 1% or less. And if you remember the first, uh, one of the first slides we, we had, we talked about how among chronic diseases, MNS disorders are actually the number one contributor. So you see that disbalance, right? So you have something that contributes so much to the population burden of disease, but when you look at the funding, it doesn't reflect how big of a problem it is. Only 0.7% is allocated to it. And vast majority of that money actually goes to a standalone mental hospital in, in the capital. And if you remember, I had said, it takes about 30 hours to get to the capital. So for this patient, imagine. So the only service he can actually access effectively is walk the four hours to our hospital, which is close to the, the bus station, and get on a bus for about 30 hours to get to the mental hospital in, in the capital. And, and then what? Like, you know, they put him inpatient for about a week, he gets better, and then what happens? So there's this huge disconnect in, in the nature of the illness, which is usually chronic, requires ongoing support, and then the way the service delivery is, is set up, which is sporadic, you know, inaccessible, centralized, and either high intensity inpatient care or nothing. So sort of this huge gap in the, in the community level. And then uh, thinking about the resources, so about 30 million people in Nepal and there's about 100 psychiatrists, fewer neurologists for sure, and then only about 12 psychologists. So, so, so let's, let's keep thinking about these systematic factors, right? So every system, I like, I like this quote quite a lot, every system is perfectly designed to get the results, the result it gets. So when you think about these systematic factors, it's almost no surprise that a kid who is developing psychosis would go without any kind of service for several months and you know, just have this sort of miserable living situation and be, you know, be tied up in a fetal position for weeks as the only way to control his behavior. And, and, and this is not surprising again, unfortunately, that in low-income countries, when you look at uh, severe mental illness, so these are psychotic disorders, bipolar disorders, major depressive dis uh, disorder, severe type, uh, only about uh, 10% to 15% of patients receive any treatment. And I'm not talking about high quality treatment, effective treatment, just, just any treatment. So almost 80 to 90% of people with severe disorders are now receiving any treatment, zero, right? So this is a situation, and of course, it's gonna have the kind of impact that we're talking about on patients. So this is where this idea of task shifting or task sharing comes in. And you know, it has roots in you know, maternal child health and HIV and tuberculosis. Uh, and and you, may, you may see sort of the terminology shift a little bit. It used to be task shifting. Uh, and, and people now use the term task sharing. The shifting, the, the, what was not very you know, desirable about this term was that it sounded like, I'm supposed to do a bunch of stuff but I'm gonna shift it to you, now it's your responsibility. And task sharing has this more sort of, a, we're, we're a team, we're going to share some of these tasks, you're going to do some, I'm going to do some. So task sharing is, is more preferred these days. But anyway, the idea is the same, which is because the burden of illness is so high at the population level, but the specialists available to treat those illnesses is just so rare uh, that you have to have non-specialists, you have to have other folks who are traditionally not in charge of treating these illnesses, be it HIV, be it tuberculosis, or, or mental neurological and substance use disorders, uh, these other folks, primary care providers, community health workers, you know, non-specialist care providers, and in some cases even teachers and traditional healers, they should be doing some of this uh, care delivery work in concert with the, the larger sort of healthcare delivery system. So that's where task shifting comes in. This is going to be a key term, so you know, if people still are not clear about it, please feel free to ask. Uh, so what does task shifting look like for MNS disorders? Uh, again, people may know about this. So on the left, there's the, this is the MHGAP, the Mental Health Gap Action Program, which again, the WHO will call it mental health. I'm gonna call it mental health, but it's really mental neurological and substance use disorders. Uh, and it covers a whole bunch of uh, illnesses, uh, as you can see on the right. So it includes you know, epilepsy, dementia, depression, psychosis, uh, and, and for kids as well. And this is a snapshot from the intervention guide. There is a humanitarian intervention guide, so HIG versus IG, so MHGAP IG will give you the list that I have here. 
image gap HIG has few other things like PTSD and stress disorders uh, for humanitarian uh, crisis situations. Uh, so, so this has been really the, the primary engine that's been distributed around the world now. That, you know, we're going to scale up services uh, by using task sharing so that we can have these sort of simple to use algorithms uh, to treat uh, these, these high priority illnesses, but these are designed to be delivered by primary care providers rather than specialists like psychiatrists or neurologists. Which brings us to this question of balancing these three critical parts of healthcare delivery, quality, cost, and access. And you may have heard of this as, you know, the IOM used to refer to this as the, the iron triangle. And the idea was you can only get two out of three. So what that means, for example, for psychiatry. So if you want good quality care, right? So that's, a, that's a, this part. If you want good quality care, and you also want to have great access, you need to have highly trained people like psychiatrists maybe, or nurse practitioners with psychiatric training. You need a lot of them so that they can you know, actually provide access, but that's gonna cost you a lot of money. <clears throat> now if you say cost is a huge burden, we can't have these specialists that are too expensive, we can't, can't afford a psychiatrist. Now uh, let's, let's have a primary care provider do this because they are cheaper, or a community health worker will do it because they are cheaper, and they can provide you know, great access, but the risk now is you might lose quality, right? So this is sort of this trilemma of healthcare, and, and this you'll see in, in all sorts of healthcare delivery uh, decisions, uh, in, even in UCSF, like this, this is gonna be the challenge. And, and the idea was you can't have all three, so hence, hence the term, but it's a triangle, it's an iron triangle. It's very stiff, you can only bend two sides of this. So, so again, let, let, let's get these concepts in our mind, because when we think of task sharing, what do we mean? Are we saying, well, it's too expensive to hire a bunch of psychiatrists or neurologists, but we need to have access. So are we going to be okay with compromising on quality? But of course, we're not going to say that, right? So it's because we don't want people to get low quality care. Ultimately, we want people to get high quality care. So, but how do you balance all this? That's what we're going to spend the rest of the talk today. All right, time for me to pause again. So we've covered these three things. We talked about the mental health burden. We've contextualized the setting that I'm going to work that, that I'll be describing. And we talked about what task sharing is and what some of the basic fundamental challenges are. Any questions before we dip, take a deeper dive into what it's like to practically use task sharing in these settings? And if anyone has questions they just like to share verbally right now, feel free. You can jump on in. I think folks are, are happy, Vibhav. Either it's very clear or people are zoned out. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, all right, so let's talk about some of the challenges. So this is, this is our medical director who's a primary care. I think I'm seeing something on the chat. Very clear, thank you. Thank you, I appreciate that. <laughs> um, so he's a, he's a general practitioner. So this is like a family medicine doctor in the US. Uh, so a GP, MD, GP is, is what's, what his degree would be called. And fortunately, he actually gets some dedicated training in, in MNS disorders as part of his residency. Um, but as people probably know, most of the care around the world in low-income countries and middle-income countries too, isn't actually delivered by people who completed residency training. It's, it's delivered by people who complete medical school, which includes about a year of internship, and they go out into the world and they treat patients. Let me, something's blinking, so let me check it. Yes, yeah, so someone wants to learn more about the EHR. So if you want to learn more, uh, nepalehr.com is the website to go to. So our team has uh, created a dedicated website because there are a lot of people who want to learn how to do this. And we've been, that, that our team actually has been helping other sites in Nepal uh, implement this as well. So nepalehr.com. If .com doesn't work, try .org. I should know this, but it's one of those two. Um, but it's based on OpenMRS, which is this you know, worldwide open access uh, medical record system. All right, so, so what we wanted to understand was what was happening. So we talk about task sharing and we talk about having these primary care providers to deliver care, uh, in, you know, MNS care. So, so let's understand what's actually going on. That was our first question. This is a study we did back in 2015. And we wanted to really do a needs assessment uh, with, uh, with uh, primary care providers, these are generalists, not specialists, at three district level hospitals in rural Nepal. So we did five focus groups. Uh, and, we, and, and the goal really was to understand what's happening, what are you doing when it comes to mental health, so that we can, we can think about task sharing. Again, now think about the iron triangle, right? So the quality, cost, and access. 
So what I'll do next is I'm going to show some quotes uh, from the focus group. And these are physicians or health assistants, which are similar to sort of physician assistants in the US, so three years of medical training as opposed to four to five years of medical training that the doctors would have. So these are health assistants or uh, uh, generalist physicians working at the front lines, uh, taking care of patients. So I first asked them about their training, what kind of training that they've received in, in medical school, because that's the only training they have in which they rely on to deliver care. Uh, so, so this person said, this is a doctor saying, I went to the, the, the sort of hiding on my side, but essentially it says, I went to the psychiatric ward once and that was to take my exam. So his only exposure to psychiatric care was to show up at the psychiatric ward to take a test. And, and I said, well, what happened in the psychiatric ward? So these are essentially jail-like settings where people with severe mental illness are essentially locked up. And he said, I was terrified. Like his, his experience in learning psychiatry was terror. So he didn't actually even learn how to take care of patients. He went in and he came out with more stigma and more fear about what it's like to take care of people with mental illness. And I said, well, what's in this exam that you talked about? You know, uh, what do they ask? And they said, oh, it was very predictable. You know, one year they would ask, what are, what are their DSM criteria for schizophrenia? And the next year they would ask, what are their DSM criteria for depression? So this, this is actually, I don't even know why they had to go to the psych ward to do this test. Uh, and all they had to do is memorize the criteria. There's nothing about actually diagnosing patients. There's nothing about actually treating them. Um, and it was all about just, you know, showing up, memorizing the criteria, and then, and then moving on. And now you pass your psych. So this is the sum total of their psychiatric training in medical school. But patients show up. Like, we can't just say, well, I'm not trained. Like, you know, these are in rural regions. These are frontline doctors. You know, patients are showing up. So I said, you know, what, tell me what your experience is like when, you, when you're treating people because they're still showing up even though you don't have training. So the, the doctor said, sometimes they don't tell you any of your symptoms. Sometimes they report too many complaints. So they were sort of describing this frustration uh, that they were experiencing, that the providers were experiencing, and interacting with patients with mental illness. And you know, sometimes I've heard something similar described from our paramedical providers here. And this, in my mind, is just someone who hasn't been adequately trained to interview uh, uh, you know, a, a person with potential mental illness. Right, so someone's hesitant, they don't want to talk about it, talk to you. But well, why is that? Is it a trust issue? Is it something about the you know the, the nature of the thing that they want to talk about? It makes them very uncomfortable. Is it the environment? It's not conducive to sort of talking about confidential things. Sometimes they'll report too many companies. What's going on here? Like are they are they so fragile? Are they just trying to get help? They're saying, I have this, I have that, I have that, just help me with something. And and if you're not equipped to sort of manage that with with your interview skills, then you feel sort of overwhelmed and you don't know what to do. You sort of feel like I am ill-equipped to, to, to handle this. I said, so what do you do? Because you know, the patient's in front of you, like, what do you do? And they, they said, if it's a psychotic patient, if they have you know, severe psychotic symptoms or they're, or they're manic, then they will say, get on the bus, take the 30 hour journey to go to the Capitol, because that's where the, the inpatient psychiatric facilities are. But not everyone needs to do that, and not, not everyone can do that. And again, there's a, there's a huge chunk of people with depression and anxiety and PTSD and sort of other illnesses that, that are not behaviorally as disruptive uh, that, that warrant this sort of 30-hour trip to the, to the capital. So I asked, what do you do for them? And they said, you know, we provide them counseling. We provide counseling. Everyone said counseling. Uh, and I said, you know, tell me, tell me exactly what you mean by counseling, because, you know, you've been saying this. And they said, oh, we just learn how to counsel from our seniors and professors in medical school, and we do what us what they did back then. So I said, okay, let's do a role play. I'm the patient, counsel me. This is a doctor talking to a patient. You think too much, you take too many things to heart, you don't have any real illness, just take this medication. And I don't know whether to laugh or cry when I see this, right? This is it's just so sad. Like, first of all, this is not counseling. And second of all, saying things like, you don't have a real illness, but take this meds. Why am I taking meds if I don't have a real illness? I'm suffering. Why are you telling me I'm not, I don't have a real illness? So there's just so many things wrong with this. But again, you know, remember the quote earlier, like this is the kind of result you're going to get if your system is not designed to take care of people and it's not designed to train people well. So they saw, the doctors saw their seniors say these things. That's why they're saying these things. And unless we fix that, they're going to keep saying these things. These are not sort of callous people. They're like well-meaning, caring doctors who are choosing to work in the front lines and in rural regions with low pay, with you know, difficult circumstances, um, but we haven't equipped them to actually take care of you know, people with mental illness. And then I say, well, these medications that you're talking about, what kind of medications are these? What are you doing? Uh, what are you prescribing? Um, 
and and if this was a you know if we were in person, I would ask people uh, what's going on with uh, what's your guess in terms of these medications. So yeah, I'll, I'll just ask you to think about it. What do you think is the medications that are being prescribed? And turns out most of the medications uh, are actually vitamins and painkillers. And and these are not even psychotropic medications. This is not going to improve your depression. This is not going to improve your anxiety disorder. It might improve your sort of mild illness as a placebo, and that's why they were being prescribed. But it's not going to improve people with moderate to severe illness in any way, right? And 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 I asked them why this was going on, and they said, "Well, vitamins we use them as placebo because we don't know what else to prescribe, so we just say, well, at least give them vitamins." And then painkillers, and again, this is very familiar to people who work internationally, and even among sort of uh, non-Western populations in the U.S. Like a lot of the presenting complaints uh, in, in anxiety and depression disorders are uh, somatic, meaning they're sort of physical, right? So they will say, I have body aches, I have dizziness, joint pain, all sorts of stuff. And and turns out this is not actually just a non-Western phenomenon. Uh, if you, if you, there's a really elegant study done from the Kaiser Foundation, where, by Kaiser Foundation, where they looked at were people who were ultimately diagnosed with depression by a psychiatrist, what was the initial presenting complaint um, when they first presented to the primary care system? And 70% of the time, it was actually pain. People did not come in saying, I feel low or I'm depressed. They came in saying, I have pain. And then again, you know, this is a complex thing. We think uh, that it's a combination of uh, people, again, there's this almost self-stigma and there's a societal stigma to acknowledging that you have a low mood or you have depression. And it's easier to acknowledge that you have pain first. And the second is when you think about, when you think about the complaints or the concerns that a patient brings to the primary care provider as currency, because it is currency. You go in with something and you get something in return. Right? So you go in and have these problems and the, and the healthcare system gives you something in return. If the currency is, I feel sad, and then the, 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 the transaction results in, you're thinking too much. You think you take too many things too hard. This is not real. Then you'll switch to a different currency. You will say, I have aches and pains. Because then the, the system will say, oh, I'm sorry. All right, let's examine. Let's do an x-ray. So that's another theory that when you, if you have a healthcare system that's not designed to take psychological complaints seriously, right, and, and actually adequately address them, then you will have the population mainly present physical complaints aches and pains because that is something you are actually taking seriously and you're doing something about it. So as a result, you see a lot of people presenting with aches and pains. All that aside, there's still a very real phenomenon that there is probably you know, a lower threshold for pain among people with depression and anxiety disorders. So there is, you know, we don't really know how these illnesses actually function. People think it's an autoimmune system a problem. So there's, there's probably some relationship between pain and depression on just as it is at a, at a biological or biological level. But clearly, there's a there's an anthropological or sociological system here at work that's that's creating uh, this high presentation of pain. So the, the the short version is you look at this and it's it's just very depressing, right? So that we've written about this, if people are interested, there's, there's more sad slash funny quotes in this paper if people are interested. But what was very clear is that the education system was just not designed. To, to help these primary care providers engage in task sharing. So if you give them a protocol and say, this is a criteria for depression, this is a criteria for anxiety disorders, and here are the medications, they, they don't have the basic equipment to actually implement that, uh, those, those protocols. Right? The quality of care, again, back to the iron triangle, the quality of care is gonna be very low, even though you have a very well-designed sort of evidence-based set of guidelines. All right, so that, that takes us to, so, this is a list of challenges, right? So I'm gonna, we're gonna populate this slide as we go forward. So the first challenge is there is li very little, in many cases, absolutely no eminence training among healthcare professionals and low resource settings. So by the way, let me, let me take a pause. I, I remember seeing a bunch of things on the chat. I just wanna make sure, uh, or should yeah. I just rely on I, someone else? Yeah, we, yeah, we can help. And actually I, I see it right here. Deborah, you had some great points in the chat. I was just responding to you. Do you wanna share them real fast? There are several different um, I, I, hi, I, I think, well, maybe they'll come up in this part of the talk, but I guess I'm just curious about how task sharing works, especially when we're asking teachers and other non-professionals who have their own vulnerabilities to do this, this extra work. And I think a lot of us do this anyway. Um, 
those of us that are working in these kinds of communities um, ourselves, but also we see it with many of the people we work with. Um, sometimes it happens organically, this task sharing, I call it in my work, I've called it triage, because that's how I experience it, um, shifting all these roles. Um, but I'm curious in Nepal how that plays out and, and what the, I mean, maybe con some of the hidden consequences of that are for the people providing this informal care, this, because we're ultimately substituting for our systems that are failing us. And that has, that I think has mental health consequences for the folks doing the task sharing too. Yeah, no, that's a great point. And thank you. Thank you for raising this. Uh, the, the limitation of this presentation, again, my work is I'll be mainly focusing on healthcare professionals uh, rather than teachers. I was just mentioning that as an example of, you know, just a full definition of task sharing. But I totally appreciate it. I mean, this happens all the time. And, you know, I'm in conversations with people here as well. Like you said, like you know, teachers, your, your, you know, their parents. Like, essentially, parents are doing so much of the mental health care you know, work, really, because they are the first people that, that, you know, that get affected by a kid who's having some kind of mental health problem beyond the kid himself, of course. Um, but, but, uh, but yeah, so you're totally right. If you really want to do this correctly, if you want to do it, again, with high quality, right, you need to equip them. And just like these doctors and, and health assistants are not equipped to actually take care of this. And if you throw people in the front lines and say, now you got to also take care of depression, but you're poorly supported, there isn't a, a, there isn't a backup system, there isn't a person that you can lean on and say, hey, can you help me with this? Uh, or, you know, even questions like, I am having trouble. Like, I listened to this person like you told me to, and they told me all the stuff that they've been through, and now I can't sleep at night. Like, and it's just a horrible burden on someone who is not trained to do that or doesn't have a system to support them to do that. Now, we'll, we'll touch on some of these issues, you know, but, but unfortunately not so much on, on working with uh, teachers and other uh, professions. I'm happy to get into that. I have some sort of personal experience and not so much at a professional level, but I'm, I'm happy to talk about but yeah, thank you. Thank you for raising that point. So, so let me let me go forward with the, the the issue this here about sort of how do you train people, or the fact that the training is just so inadequate, right? So, so what we ended up doing was we realized that even training people was going to be a big challenge uh, because uh, the, the 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 sort of protocol based you know you do a test and then you you know provide this kind of treatment doesn't actually work very well in uh, some of the MNS disorders as as we know because it's such a skills-based uh, diagnostic system. Like the behavioral neurology is the same way. Like there isn't like a clear test that you can send the person to, to, to get. And even if, you, even if there is a test, uh, in a lot of these places, you may not have you know, access to MRI or CAT scan or some of these other you know, sort of equipment dependent um, diagnostic tools. So it's because it's a skills-based uh, training, you, you actually need a psychiatrist to go in and train people, which again, takes time in, in, in a country where the ratio is one to two million, it's gonna be really tough. So what we did was we used what's called a flipped classroom model. So if people are not familiar with it, the, the short version is you, you look at your whole curriculum in terms of um, what ultimately needs to be taught to the, to the trainee. And then you say, how many of these things can be done remotely? And how many of, the, how many of these things require in-person sort of on-site presence of a specialist? And, and what we did with, after that was uh, I ended up creating a, a set of online lectures um, that, that, that would cover the things, so the knowledge-based competencies that you could just teach from a lecture format, that you didn't really need someone to be there in person, right? So I would record a lecture on, on depression and PTSD and things like those, and, and we would have them sort of uh, disseminated to the primary care providers without a psychiatrist actually having to be there. So they would spend a week, you know, a couple of hours every day looking at these lectures and having a local discussion and listing questions that may have come up from the lectures. And after the sort of knowledge stuff has been already uh, disseminated and pushed out to the learners, then the psychiatrist comes in and does this kind of in-person, I'm going to give you a case, why don't you put what you learned from the lectures to use and I'm going to listen to you, you know, so there's, there's like a it's like an observer sheet, making sure they're doing things like making good eye contact, you know, using a tone of voice that sort of presents, uh, creates an environment that feels open and non-judgmental. So stuff that you can't really teach remotely or from a from a you know a recorded lecture, things that you have to watch and give feedback, and that's how I learned from psychiatry, uh, and 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 so combining this kind of um, 
home-based, um, you know, lecture-based, or video-based or learning with in-person skills training. That's, that's a flipped classroom model. That's what we ended up using. And the benefit of that is that you really created a scalable training model because the amount of time that a psychiatrist had to spend in person was cut in half because half of the training was delivered remotely. Uh, and we've written about this if people are interested in this a great journal called Global Mental Health. Um, and, and, and this helped us not just help our own clinicians. After the earthquake, those training materials, the, the recorded videos, were pushed out by the WHO to hundreds and hundreds of doctors who were getting sort of these you know, humanitarian crisis, mental health management um, training after the, by the earthquake. So there was, there was potential to scale that up in a way that we would not have been able to scale up sort of this fully in-person training, which is much more resource intensive and expensive. So the main strategy here is that whatever training we come up with has to pay attention to scale uh, because the, the gap is so high and the way to train people requires in-person time. We can, we can try to shift as much as possible to lecture-based or online or video, some kind of self-guided learning so that the in-person, you know, precious expensive time is, is not taking over the cost of the training. So the second challenge we'll talk about is uh, sort of related to the question that was brought up earlier. So this is, a, this is our doctor you know, evaluating a patient and, and you know, just a general evaluation. So before I move forward, let me actually have people put something into the chat. What is um, the median on average? How long does this interaction last? So I'm not talking about psychiatry or neurology. I'm just talking a, a, a patient goes into a doctor's office somewhere in the world What's the median amount of time that they spend interacting with the, with the doctor? Just put in your guesses in the chat box, please. Don't be shy. 15 minutes, 20 minutes, 10, 5, 10, 7, 3. Look at that precision on that 7. Um, so, yeah, so, so a wide range with. Um, some optimists saying 20, uh, and then some people saying three, five, 10, so 15. All right, thank you, thank you for engaging, thank you. I'm gonna orient people to this a little bit, all right? So this is, this is the consultation length in minutes. This is a, this is a study from 2017 that looked at, you know, it's, it's essentially a meta-analysis. They looked at multiple studies that had presented uh, this data, and they plotted the, the, the number of minutes against per capita healthcare spending for that country. Right? So the median is actually five around the world, right? So, which also means half of the people, there's another way to think about this, right? Half of the people around the world, when they go to see their doctor, get less than five minutes in, 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 or in, in the interaction. They have. This, this is where India is and China, just because India and China are both sort of below five, like that's really essentially what drove the median. Uh, Nepal is at about three minutes. Um, the US, it's like 20 minutes. And, and I, I'm sure, like I, when I first saw this, I was like, 20 minutes is not enough, right? You know, when, when people have all sorts of problems, especially if they have chronic diseases and like comorbidities, like 20 minutes is not enough. But, but the US actually, on general, there's a lot more time available to us with patients compared to some of the, the, the other countries in the world. And, and, and there's some, you know, there, again, this is, this is not a perfect study by any means, and, and I was told that in Austria, apparently going to the doctor is actually very common. So even though they get five minutes, they might be going to the doctor like every few weeks is what I was told by someone who works there. Um, but, but again, so there's some variation and there's something, there's a bunch of outliers here. Bulgaria is just not putting in as much money in health, but they're still able to get 20 minutes. And I, you know, who knows what that really means, but, but there's some outliers. But in general, five minutes median and then there's some correlation against the you know how much you're spending but in general five minutes is the median amount of time that a clinician spends with a patient now now again bring back this question of task sharing right so these are these are clinicians who have gone through you know a few years of medical training really no access to consultation consultants and and they have to somehow take care of primary care and also oh by the way hiv oh by the way tuberculosis <laughs> and mns disorders and we just add and add all these things that we have to do. And at some point, like I never mentioned, like this is just too much. And you, you only have five minutes to do this. So it's just absurd that this is going to actually be successful, right? The quality of care is going to suffer if this is what you're working with. And, and the other challenge is most of the evidence for task sharing comes from well-funded randomized controlled trials or well-funded trials 
where the patients will actually get a lot more time because these are funded studies. And when you take the evidence from those studies and you know, put it into real world settings where the patient has five minutes or the provider actually has five minutes to do all this work, it's just not gonna work. The quality of care is absolutely gonna suffer. So the other challenge, of course, now is clinical visits are about two to three minutes long. Very frustrating. How do you put all this into the into your clinical care? And then the other challenge, again, in the behavioral neurology and in psychiatry, is that these diagnostics are skill-based, right? So you can't, you can't rush a diagnosis for depression. And I'll, I'll share an anecdote from my side. So my, uh, as, as uh, John mentioned, I, I, uh, uh, I grew up in Nepal. My, uh, my grandmother was there, and she was diagnosed with uh, schizophrenia at the age of 68. But when I saw that, I was like, this, this is not schizophrenia. I was like, you know, when, when someone is diagnosed with schizophrenia at the age of 68, very likely she has dementia, right? So that should be the highest on your list. But then if you give someone who has two to three minutes to see a patient, and you give him a checklist that, you know, just looks like psychosis, and you're like, all right, this looks like psychosis to me, because there's a bunch of behavioral problems, and, you know, she was confused, and she was yelling at people, and her sleep was all disrupted. Someone looked at a you know, checklist and said, ah, this looks like psychosis to me, diagnosed her with schizophrenia and put her on a high dose of Halliburton. Now, when the diagnostics are skills-based and they take time, right? It takes time to actually do a good diagnosis. You gotta rule out a bunch of stuff. You gotta understand what the patient's context is. You gotta understand why they're having a particular behavior. Because behavior, like I you know, said to my trainees, it's a snapshot, it's a picture. You don't know what that picture really means if you don't understand what happened before, what happened after, what was the context, what's the function, why were they upset, why was she angry? You know, is it because of the delusion, or is it because you know people didn't understand what she needed and it was a very basic thing that people just don't get it, or she forgot something, right? So, so there, there's so many things um, that require time and they just cannot be rushed in a way. Honestly, you can rush an, uh, an HIV test if you suspect HIV. <clears throat> send the patient down the hall, they get an HIV test. Your time is actually still you know, spared. They come back and you know exactly what to do. They were different with MNS disorders. It takes time. And, and this is, I think, it's a huge challenge in sort of you know, putting in these task sharing initiatives that have roots in HIV and tuberculosis that have very simple to use tests and then plugging them in into these illnesses that do not have easy diagnostics. So we spend a lot of time training people on how to actually do diagnostics. The, the person signing up is our you know, consulting psychiatrist. And, uh, and the other thing we did was we really wanted to understand what it's like for the clinicians to actually engage in task sharing. So first we asked them, what are you doing right now? And then as we train them, as they become better and better at taking care of mental illness and neurological disorders and substance use disorders, we asked them, well, you're clearly having problems because you, know, you have two to three minutes for a patient. This is not enough. Uh, these diagnostics take a long time. What's going on? So we, we got recommendations from them. Again, people are interested. You can read about this. So we, we said, how, what's the best way to integrate mental health into your primary care setting? WHO says this is the best way to do it. What do you think? And, and a bunch of stuff came up. And, and based on that, we came up with this, uh, this model. I'm going to walk people through this. Um, but this is based on the collaborative care model that was initially developed in the University of Washington in, in Seattle. So, so let, let's talk about what happens with the patient here. So this is the patient first point of contact is usually a doctor or health assistant. So this is a nurse practitioner or PA level person. Uh, and then this person, this is the person who has two to three minutes with the patient, right? So they may say, you know what? I think you may have some kind of mental illness. Uh, how about you go and meet with the counselor? And here's the key part. This person is down the hall. This is not come back next day. This is not come back in a week. Here's an appointment. No, it's, let's, um, let's walk down the hall. The patient navigator is going to take you and walk you to the counselor's office right now. It might take you an hour or so to wait to see them, but it, let's do this today, right? And the counselor is someone who has received about six months of behavioral health training. Not ideal, but actually much better than where most, uh, most sort of even doctors are in terms of their behavioral health and mental health training. So this person does a full sort of 30 to 45 minute psychosocial evaluation. So this does sort of the what's the context, what's going on here, why are you upset, why are you angry, is this depression, is it domestic violence, is it dementia, all this kind of you know, comprehensive assessment. And they'll use um, validated tools like PHQ-9 that has been validated in Nepali and sort of other tools like that. And then they will say, all right, here's what I think is going on. And they'll walk the patient back to the doctor and say, oh, you know what, based on what I, what I understand, this looks like severe depression to me. Um, 
And I think we need to do both therapy, which I will provide, and this person probably also needs medication, which you can write. So now the doctor has this report on the hand, which they can say, all right, now I feel comfortable because someone who is specialized in this has spent you know, a good amount of time saying that this indeed is depression. Or the counselor might say, you know what, this is actually domestic violence. Like this is not your classic sort of depression. We actually need to work with uh, the patient and perhaps even the, the, the couple to figure this out and figure out you know, how we can support her through this. Medication is not really going to help this situation. So please don't prescribe anything. Uh, and then you know, I will continue to work with so this kind of evaluation and treatment planning happens as a team, and this is you know, true task sharing rather than just task shifting, saying, doctor, you do all of this work, right? And then the patient may get you know, either medications or a follow-up appointment with the counselor, and they go home. And then the community health workers, this is a new component, because again, in the US, it's, it's just a shame that they don't really exist at the level that they should. The community health workers can be contacted by the, the doctor or even the counselor to make sure that the patient is you know, adhering to their treatment and if they're missing their appointments, they can, you know, they'll come back to the hospital. Right? So the community health workers will even escort the patients back to the hospital. Now, as you can see, so far, the psychiatrist hasn't even shown up in the picture. So this is all happening locally. Now, the psychiatrist is actually off-site, and this is where telepsychiatry actually comes in or telemedicine comes in. And, and, and again, I'm going to say psychiatrist, but really this person does all MNS disorders, right? So mental neurological and substance use disorders. So what they do is that every week, the psychiatrist talks to the counselors and says, tell me about all the patients that you saw. And this is different from tell me about the patients that you have problems with. And this is a very key point when it comes to quality of care. We're not saying, we've trained you, go off and do your you know, thing. If you have questions, let me know. What happens with that kind of approach is that blind spots get missed. Like, like people like my grandmother will get diagnosed with schizophrenia when they have dementia. Because the person making the diagnosis is confident that they're right. And if I'm confident that I'm right and I have a blind spot, I'm not going to ask for a consultation, right? But if you do a proactive consultation, if you bring a psychiatrist that sort of says, hey, let's go through every patient, every diagnosis, how did you come up with that? And what's the treatment plan? Let's do that. I have half day for you. And that's sort of, you know, the FTE that we have with the psychiatrist. And this is why we call this a proactive consultation. It's not on demand, I have a question, help me. It is proactive. You tell me what you did and let's talk about that. And, and this may seem very unusual in a workplace setting, but this is exactly how we teach people in medicine. Like this is how I learned how to do therapy, you know, or, or even take care of any kind of patient. No one said, all right, after two years of medical school, you've learned everything you need to know about the disease and the treatments. Now go off and see patients and let me know if you have a question. No one does that. You send them off as a med student and you say, come back and tell me what you think is going on. So this kind of proactive consultation. I'm gonna assume that you have blind spots and I'm gonna help you, not in this kind of you know, punishment or shaming kind of way, but in this, hey, you're learning this for the first time. Of course, it's gonna be tough for you. Let's work on this together. It's a proactive consultation, key part. And this is what I think is missing from a lot of task sharing interventions. They do on-demand consultation, not proactive consultation. And then as far as the doctors and health assistants go, <clears throat> The psychiatrist comes in once every quarter and spends a week uh, to do both the training that I had mentioned, the flipped classroom model, where before the psychiatrist comes in, the doctors and the counselors, they all get together and watch the videos. And the psychiatrist comes in and does sort of uh, you know, skills-based training. And they also uh, watch the, the, the clinicians in action rather than seeing, and, you know, seeing patients themselves, which is another model that people have used in the past having a consultant uh, come in you know, once every few months and just seeing 200 patients at a time uh, and just following up that way, which does not build local capacity, which again goes back to this two to three minute per patient kind of problem. But what the psychiatrist does now is that they're essentially thinking of themselves as a coach. So they watch the, the clinicians see patients and after the, uh, the clinic visit or sometimes even during, they'll say, you know, the question that you asked that way, that's a little bit judgmental. You know, you forgot to ask about your know, childhood trauma. You, you know, that kind of coaching rather than me showing up and just seeing the patients myself, which doesn't build local capacity. So this is the role of the consultant psychiatrist. So as you can see, we have, we have separated the tasks out in a way that each person does only what they're sort of required to do. And in terms of cost, so go back to this iron triangle again, right? So the cost ends up being managed by the fact that the consultant psychiatrist is only spending half a day and during that half day, they're reviewing easily 50 plus, you know, sometimes even 100 patients. As the counselors get better and better, and we see this with med students and residents all the time, as the counselors get better and better at, you know, 
presenting cases and you know not making mistakes, this consultation becomes faster and faster. So these days they're spending two minutes or one minute per patient in the consultation. In the beginning, they were spending about 20 minutes just talking about one patient, so they get better and better with time. But what, what that means is that the most expensive person's time is being used in a way that's most cost effective, right? So they're just reviewing the case. They're not seeing patients, they're not doing all this elaborate stuff, they're just reviewing the cases. Quality is largely assured by part B training. And then in the EHR, we have decision support built in as well. So that catches some of the quality problems. And then it's also assured by this proactive consultation model. And access is provided because all providers deliver medical care. It's not just one specialized, you know, designated medical care provider. Because again, unlike some of these other illnesses, this is the number one burden. So, you know, the, the, the number of patients is just so high that you can't have one designated medical. So that's been sort of the, the, the way to hack the, the iron triangle by minimizing costs, ensuring quality, and expanding access. All right, uh, I'm just, this is just pictures of our counselors providing therapy. This is our counselor doing the video visit with the psychiatrist when they review all the patients on the panel. Uh, I'm gonna go through this quickly and then see if there are any questions come up, right? So the way we have described the onsite counselor is that we said, think of this as a lab test, because this is such a strange thing for the primary care providers to do, to sort of walk someone over and sort of say, hey, can you tell me what's going on with this patient? And we told them, think of this as if you suspect someone is pregnant or you suspect someone has pneumonia, you would send them to the lab. It's the same thing. If you suspect someone has depression, send them to the lab, which is the counselor. And that helped them understand sort of the clinical workflow. And then we use validated instruments and practice supervision. All right, any questions? I feel like there was something on the chat that I haven't seen, but yeah, before I go forward. There was a comment um, and a question from Kevin. Um, it seems that treatment algorithms would be useful to support task sharing, especially one that includes patient age, perhaps AI. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great point. We, there's, there's actually a lot we can potentially do uh, using machine learning with the panel. Because as you can imagine, the, the, what I mean by the panel is like essentially it's a registry. Of all the patients that, have, uh, that were seen and all the patients that have been followed up. And what's amazing about the registry is that it's got patients age, you know, a bunch of demographic stuff, and then uh, their PHU-9 scores for people who have depression and which medication they're taking. And you can sort that right now. It's, it's very archaic. Uh, it's just sorting. Um, we sorted out by saying, okay, these patients, their P29 scores are not actually getting better through time. So this is, they're going to get flagged for discussion in the panel review, and they're going to get flagged for, you know, potentially increasing the antidepressant dose or, you know, revisiting a diagnosis or some kind of stuff. So all of that can actually potentially be automated. The other thing that can also be automated as the data set increases, you know, in, in just a number of data points, we can probably, even when the patient begins, we can say, all right, you know what, in our experience in the past, people with these characteristics, you know, the PHU-9 score presenting at this level, you know, family history also of depression, age, you know, male, you know what, we actually probably need to accelerate to the antidepressant dose higher for these patients, just because we know that that's what the profile fits. And that's really hard to do manually, and, and I can imagine AI helping with that. Um, but yeah, that, that, that's absolutely a potential application. We just, we haven't gotten to that yet. All right. Was there anything else? Okay. All right. I'm almost done. Thank you. All right. This is this is sort of the final slide. So this is just a this is just um, our Heal Fellowship Partnership uh, Global Mental Health uh, program that uh, we were described in the beginning. They they do this work. Uh, this is a fellow visiting a patient's home, uh, also at the same site. I'm gonna skip this. Uh, just one quick slide on COVID response. This is our, you know, fever clinic that was set up recently. So this right now we're really focusing primarily on staff mental health actually because a lot of the staff members are just very distressed. That's so where our counselors are helping them. Psychological first aid. If people are not familiar with this, this is a really good construct uh, in, in in really helping people get basic needs met and making sure that they're able to you know, take care of those things that are the most for forefront of their mind. People think. You know, managing a crisis situation is about like meditation or you know reducing stress. That's important, but like psychological first aid is really about what's most important on your mind. How can you meet your basic needs? And here's here's accurate information. It's amazing the power of accurate information and unambiguous statements, which unfortunately the U.S. leadership is just totally failing at. 
uh, how unambiguous the statements are actually very helpful in reducing stress in a situation like this. Um, our counselors have uh, switched to remote counseling. They'll call patients now as opposed to asking them to come to visit. And continuity of care. So people who already have bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, depression, all, all sorts of illnesses that require ongoing treatment, those are the ones that are being prioritized because often they're the ones who end up being falling through the cracks and not getting medications because of supply chain disruptions, confusion about whether to go into the hospital or not. So that's where we're prioritizing, but again, there's a lot more work to be done on traveling remote. Quickly going back to this patient, and this is gonna be the last slide. Uh, remember, so the 16-year-old guy with schizophrenia who, um, who, was, um, who was tied up in a fetal position for about two weeks. So, you know, he was enrolled in our program, started taking medications, and I went to see him uh, about a year ago, and, you know, he's doing much better. He's not tied up anymore. You can totally engage with him. He's a brilliant kid. The school wouldn't take him back for all sorts of reasons. But uh, his brother is in school, so he's, you know, he's like, oh, what do you do all day? He's like, oh, I read books and I help around the house. Amazing. So much better than you know, the situation that was earlier. So I asked him to bring a book down, and he's like, yeah, we read a passage together. And again, it was, it was so much fun to see this kind of functional change. And I asked him the most important neurocognitive test of our time. I asked him, do you know what a selfie is? And, and he said, yes. And I said, what is it? He goes, you take a picture of yourself with friends. So I consented him because he could actually consent now. Then he could not, so I wanted to take a picture of his arms with his dad's consent. Uh, so I consented him, and uh, we took a selfie together. Uh, all right, this is my email address. If people are interested and, you know, there's questions that come up afterward, I'm always interested in talking about vulnerable health. But yeah, sorry, this feels like I spent more time than I had was allocated. But yeah, um, over to you. Thank you. That was terrific, Biva. Uh, thank you so much for that very uh, thought-provoking presentation. And to lead us into the, the discussion, I think there's going to be a number of questions. To lead us into that, uh, maybe I'll first turn to Brian Lawler and uh, Irasima at uh, Trinity College Dublin, our colleagues there. Brian's also the deputy director at, of G GBHI. Uh, so uh, do either of you have initial reflections on Bebub's presentation, uh, thoughts from your own experience, and maybe any questions to kick us off? Irasima, will I go ahead or do you want to go ahead? It should, no, it doesn't matter, either one of us. Um, okay, well, well, I, well I, I'll take a shot at it first then if you like. Um, Biva, look, thanks so much for this, this wonderful presentation. And I think yeah, I just, you did a fantastic job in taking us into your world out there. I mean, I really felt like I was there in Nepal. Um, and the stories you tell are amazing. And what a wonderful, a, a kind of a good, a positive end to the story about that, that patient. But really what strikes me about your talk is really the relevance of, what, of the work that you're doing to the whole area of brain health and GVHI. I just want to sort of maybe give some thoughts on that. Um, um, I, mean, I guess one of the most important things is that really you're addressing mental health on a global scale, which is really a core part of GBHI. You know, sometimes, you know, when we talk about brain health, we're talking a lot about neurological disorders, dementia, but I think it's really, really important to emphasize that mental health is, is a core part of brain health and part of, uh, part of our, our, our GBHI's mission. Also, I mean, you focus a lot on inequities related to mental health, which is, a, again, a core part of, of the GBHI mission. And risk factors for poor brain health, like depression, uh, very, very important to treat uh, depression. Um, one of the most common problems from a mental health point of view globally, a risk factor for the later development of dementia. And also, uh, depression is a, a core feature, a core, core factor in the poor outcome for people who have conditions like HIV and, and, and diabetes. So, well, but one, one thought I, I, I had really was about this, this, this collaborative model and whether you are thinking about this issue, this model and task sharing in terms of dementia care, in terms of assessment, uh, detection, diagnosis, chronic disease management uh, in Nepal. Uh, I, I think you, talk, you talked a lot about your focus uh, was on um, depression, mental health problems. But I, I wonder, are you thinking about this type of collaborative care model in Nepal around brain health and, and dementia assessment, diagnosis and management? And whether this type of model could be applied. Finally, I, I just I, I loved your 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 sort of fit classroom model in terms of teaching. And again, the GBHI model uh, in terms of our curriculum is very much along those lines. And I just I just thought of whether some of our 
GBHI curriculum would be of value or of interest in terms of the type of work that you do or want to do in Nepal in the future. So there are just a couple of thoughts uh, and maybe a few questions with regard to brain health and dementia and, that, and the collaborative care model. Would you like me to respond or should I wait? Uh... Camilla, I'm happy. Well, I think Camilla, depending on what Camilla or John say in terms of time, uh, whether you want to respond now or perhaps take all the questions. Sure. Why don't we have? What, thanks so much, Brian. What if Irasima? Do you want to go ahead and share your thoughts as well, and then Vibhav, you can respond to those before we open it up. Oh, sure. Um, thanks very much for a fascinating and beautifully presented talk. It was really very interesting. Um, I think the thing that struck me most through it was that. Um, my perspectives from working in Pakistan and Bangladesh are very much from the, the urban side, whereas you presented very much the rural challenges. And I thought I might just share a couple of observations about, I guess, the difference to highlight the difference between urban and rural challenges for mental and brain health in South Asia. So I guess the first one is that strikes me is in urban settings is the public and private split. Now, public services, you have really pointed out, are very much underfunded and under resourced. And in urban settings, they're still very dependent on the asylum systems. So I've visited some hospitals which have up to 1,500 beds in, in hospitals and people essentially have lifelong lengths of stay. So um, it's almost like an overprovision, but at the cost of quality. So very much a quality challenge. And that's the kind of thing that in urban settings, one still sees throughout South Asia. On the private side, sometimes there seems to be provision, not necessarily in terms of mental health, but non-mental health private practitioners providing care in urban settings. But there, of course, you have a cost um, challenge because people have to pay out of pocket. And of course, trying to institute multidisciplinary team or collaborative care models is extremely challenging because doctors don't want to share their patients because it's a loss of income. Sometimes it's perceived as a loss of face because it may seem that they don't have the expertise to manage the problem themselves. And also the challenge by patients' perceptions of a quick of the need for a quick fix. They want a quick tablet, and if you don't give it to them and you instead refer them to a therapist or a support worker, or an occupational therapist, an allied health worker, then you aren't giving them what they want and they'll simply go to somebody down the road. So those are some of the kind of challenges that, that I've seen in the urban setting. And then also reflecting on what Brian mentioned about the risks for brain health, again, in the urban setting, which I think are going to become huge, already are huge, but are things like, for example, road traffic accidents, poor brain hygiene with regards to helmets, families of five sitting on, on motorbikes and overcrowded motorways, urban air pollution, you know, a place like Dhaka, for example, has the highest particulate matter in the air in the world, um, dietary issues in the rising middle class, very high fat diets, soaring rates of diabetes, stroke, again, all with huge implications for brain health. Sedentary behavior in the over 60s, fostered by families who find it's their honor and their duty to support the older person by ensuring that they don't do anything and don't exert themselves, but of course, resulting in loss of role and de-skilling. Um, so these kinds of issues, again, very much um, in, in, in the urban setting that may be less prevalent in the rural setting. And then I think the final reflection I had, um, which perhaps you can address, is the limited, what I've seen urbanly, at least, is the limited range of interventions for mental health because of the push, which is a, a good thing, for psychotropic medications. However, that's very much the fallback position and the overprescribing, particularly of antipsychotics, for people with dementia, but also people with primary psych psychotic illnesses. And again, at the expense of psychosocial interventions, other kinds of therapies, lower dose of medication. And I'm just wondering whether your um, psychosocial counselors, which you show very nicely fit into the model, whether they provide any kind of psychosocial therapy or support, because my understanding is that they seem to be very much more on the diagnostic side supported by the psychiatrist. So um, perhaps you can clarify that last point, but the others are really just observations of other challenges, I think, that are prevalent in South Asia. Oh, thank you. This is great. A lot, a lot of great questions, and I'll try to get to them in the next couple of minutes so we can hear from the rest of the, the team as well. Uh, you know, the, the question about dementia care, we've been very interested in that for a long time. 
uh, and, and I think there's, you can probably relate to this, there's more interest on our side than on the side of the, the partners, unfortunately. And, and, and there's, this is the unfortunate thing. People think of this as sort of like a, a zero sum game. If you do dementia, then you know, are you ignoring reproductive health or something? Uh, and, and what has actually been, although we, our program is not a dementia program, what has happened when you look at the actual diagnostics, you know, we get a lot of patients with dementia as part of our mental health program. And I think we've actually gained more traction by calling it a collaborative care mental health program because they see that as like, oh, wow, yeah, we see anxiety and depression all the time. Uh, and and we, we prioritize the, the resources and the partnership and the bandwidth and everything for this. But if we had said, hey, let's do a dementia program, I think they would have actually been like, oh, no, no, that's like number 20 on the you know, 100 things that we have to tackle. It's almost been easier to combine this. And what has also happened is, once, once, you, once they become comfortable with this model and they see the value of this model, it's become easier to sort of say, hey, we can do the same thing for diabetes. We can do the same thing for cardiovascular disease. And have this specialist. You can do the, psychi- the model is the same. You can replace a psychiatrist with a neurologist or you know, the diabetologist. And, and I think that has been a good inroad. The collaborative care has been a good inroad. But yeah, the, the level of care for dementia is nowhere close to where I'd like it to be. Uh, but, but I think it's actually better than it would have been if we had just said, let's do a dementia program. Again, not, not, not an appropriate uh, situation to be in, but, but that's, that's sort of where we are. Um, in terms of the, the, the private, uh, the, your, your observations about rural-urban divide are, are absolutely spot on. Uh, I didn't talk so much about the private sector here because, first of all, they don't have private hospitals. It's not just as well established in the rural uh, sites, but they are private practitioners. So these are people who, you know, <laughs> gets me a little bit upset, but like these are people who have received sometimes no medical training uh, or some medical training, and they set up shop at a private practice, and they prey on the kind of psychological biases that you described. Like people want a quick fix. People don't want to spend a lot of time like traveling here and there and getting referrals. People don't want to go through therapy. People just want a medication, or their family sometimes they just want a medication. And a private practitioner, you know, they don't really care about quality as much. They, the more medications they prescribe, the more money they make. So, so we see a little bit of that. The way I've thought about this is. Um, you know, regulations aside, which is sort of beyond our scope right now, the way I've thought about it is our goal is to provide high quality, effective care. And, and the good thing about these settings is that, again, maybe it's different in urban settings, but word spreads very fast. So that kid, those picture that I showed, once he got better, we got so many referrals from that village because they were like, wait a second, this guy who was tied up, we didn't realize that like, he could actually get so much better. So now we're getting more and more patients coming to the hospital. And that may be a slower way of you know, moving things from the low quality private sector side to our public high quality side, but it ends up being more effective because at the end of the day, if you pro- what people really want is effective treatment. That's at the end of the day, that's what you know, the patients really want, right? And if you can demonstrate that it's possible to provide that, it just takes more time, right? Uh, then, then they will sort of get it, that it's worth the trouble. Like just to think about the patient, the, the family was ready to walk three hours to go to a traditional healer, right? It's a huge cost, three hours each way to go to a traditional healer. And it actually costs money. Traditional healers, you got to pay them things and stuff and you know, money sometimes. So it's because they have a hope that this is going to get better. It's not because, you know, they're foolish or whatever, right? So if you can generate the same kind of hope by delivering effective treatment on the public sector side, then again, I, 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 and we've seen this happen through the years that people will sort of shift their behaviors as well. And, and, and the last point about progression healers, because it comes up quite a lot, is that one of the challenges has been to train our doctors to not, again, sort of have this zero sum attitude towards traditional healers. Like the, the doctors would say, don't go to a traditional healer if you're also taking on medication. And I, and I told them, like, don't say that. Like, if they want to go to a traditional healer, let them go to a traditional healer. My patients in San Francisco go to tradition healers all the time. Uh, you know, so, so just have, the, have that be part of you know, the, the total healthcare package rather than body types. But yeah, thank you. Thank you for all the, all the great comments. The question about um, uh, the, the role of the psychosocial counselors, you're right. I didn't highlight that, but they do provide therapy. It's not as uh, high quality as we'd like, and we just hired a psychologist to help uh, the counselors provide true CBT. Right now, they're essentially doing basic relaxation techniques. So, you know, mindfulness, meditation, deep breathing, relaxation, and which is, again, goes a long way, and behavioral activation. So those are the two things that they use for anxiety and depression for the most part. But we're not doing some of the, the exposure therapy work that could happen, so the more formalized CBT, there's more room there. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so, so they do provide some therapy. And, and, and you're totally right that 
Um, it's, it's a lot harder to get people to do this, even doctors, because they're much more comfortable just writing a prescription. What I have found is it's easier to tell people what to do rather than what not to do. So if, if, if you say, don't prescribe these medications, they're like, then what am I going to do, right? But if you say, hey, why don't you just send them to the counselor? The counselor is going to take care of you. They're like, all right, now I know what to do. That takes time. It's not that simple. Uh, there's hierarchies. There's, you know, why do I give up my patients? Are you trying to say that I don't know how to do this? And uh, we've used the psychiatrist's credibility to prop up the counselors uh, because even the physicians are like, why am I sending my patient to a less trained person? But our pitch is, but this less well-trained person is supported by a psychiatrist because they talk to the psychiatrist once a week. And that's how they're getting trained. And then the physicians are like, well, if the specialist is helping them, then maybe I feel more comfortable saying that. But yeah, but it's a long conversation, but those are my initial reactions. We have um, three questions. Maybe, maybe we can consolidate um, from Elisa Resende. She's one of our senior fellows in Brazil. Elisa, do you want to share your questions directly, verbally? Um, yeah, sure. So thank you for your presentation. Very, very inspiring. But I was wondering from the point of view of somebody who, let's say somebody who wants to implement or to implement some, something like you implemented in Nepal. So how long, my questions are very practical. How did you get this funnel? How the funding was obtained? And how long did you get from having the idea of restructuring everything to the program actually up and running? I imagine some years. <laughs> and also, did you face any resistance? Like, for example, telehealth here in Brazil, we face a lot of resistance from doctors about telehealth. It's actually not um, authorized yet from, from our authorities. So, did you face so, those kind of resistance there? Yeah, great questions. And, and I'm, I'm happy to talk uh, with you directly. You, know, you, you got my email address, so I'm happy to sort of help you through this process. Uh, the, the initial funding was from a research grant, uh, like most of these sort of innovative uh, approaches. It's, it's hard to sort of get an existing, you know, bootstrapped uh, system to sort of say, hey, let's set aside money for this new thing. Uh, and unfortunately, the funding was for two years, and the, the study actually ended two years ago, and the program has continued. The, the, the hospitals have seen the value in it, and they're just putting in their own money to continue the program, which is excellent. I mean, as a researcher, I'm so happy to see that happen. It doesn't happen all the time. Uh, so the funding was research from, from conceptualization to actual, you know, seeing the first patient with this model, it took about a year and a half. Uh, and that, that included, you know, training everyone, getting everyone on the same page, and there was turnovers so of people leave and you got to, you know, start again. Uh, but it took about a year and a half. The telehealth part, we faced the same uh, challenge in Nepal. We did something very sneaky. We said, this is not telehealth, this is tele-teaching because the, the psychiatrist is not directly seeing patients, and that's key, because it's not telehealth anymore, right? The psychiatrist is teaching the counselor. They're going through cases. They're teaching them. And that, that's, you can do that. You can, you know, a psychiatrist can call anyone and teach anything. Anymore. So that helped. In, in parallel, Nepal actually changed its laws, and there's some telemedicine laws in place now. But when we started, we faced our resistance. So yeah, so remember, this is education, not, not health care. I see a question from Karen about, uh, do you work with artists? And Karen, did you want to elaborate on that? Or is that the main question? Yeah, thank you so much for that presentation. It is just amazing. Your work is so inspiring. Um, I wonder now you're collecting so many stories that are hopeful of the people that you support and care for. I was wondering if you considered uh, for the future working with arts practitioners who might be able to share these stories within the local communities to uh, continue um, to uh, spread the message and to reduce the stigma. Um, it can also help as well to address fears and concerns that people have. Um, some of them you addressed in your presentation. Um, but knowing how stories are powerful ways of getting people on board, uh, like your presentation was really powerful and the images you shared, I just wondered if, if there was a thought about uh, working collaboratively, collaboratively with artists. 
That's a great point. And I, and I love talking to GBHI people because you get voices that I wouldn't usually in my traditional sort of healthcare professional circles. Uh, this is a great point. And, and, I, and I've actually thought about this a lot. And I realize I'm not actually, thank you for your kind comments about our presentation, but I realize I actually have never been trained on how to tell good stories. And, and, and I realize in mental health, it's so tough to do that. Uh, even this patient, right? So this patient that I was able to talk about, it, consent, like, you know, as a, as a doctor, my first thought is like privacy. It's how do I tell stories about people with psychotic disorders, with depressive disorders? Because when they come in, they're in such bad situation that I can't really consult them, right? And the best I could do is like take a picture of his, of his arms and, and his dad said, oh, take as many pictures as you want of whatever you want. And I'm like, that's not consent. Like you're just, you know. So I said, no, 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 I don't feel comfortable. I just feel comfortable taking a picture of your hands. Is that okay? And he said, yes. And even then I was like, is this okay? Like, you know what I mean? Because I don't know how to do that. And then went back in and he was doing better and being able to t show that contrast. Because I remember when I was younger, when I was in med school, I would see pictures of people with tuberculosis or HIV and the before after pictures and how dramatic they were. And that, like I've attended so many presentations, I don't remember anything but those pictures, right? And, and, and the power of image and power of storytelling. And I realized that very, very late and I still don't know how to do it. So I'd love to work with folks who actually do this for a living uh, and can guide me. And sort of really, I think, I think you're totally right that, that storytelling that's hopeful that shows effectiveness, that shows improvement uh, is, is absolutely powerful. And as a healthcare worker, I, I do not know how to do that very well. So yeah, I, I would love to be able to do that more.